Nikmatashkinun <laughs> Nami naimu ma panashai chen kha ichan te cham pa timani te cham Warm Springs, Oregon Indian Reservation pa. Anakush pa mwa panashai chen kha ichan pushwai pa. And in a foreign language, hello. <laughs> How are you? It is very good to see you all and thank you so much. It is fate that brought us to this beautiful place to see and witness some incredible words, not from me, of course, but of course from these incredible authors that we're gonna meet tonight. It is destiny, so take in this moment, take in this beautiful evening, it is a pleasure. I'm Jefferson Green, my native name is Isu. I am from the Warm Springs Indian Reservation where I was born and raised just north of here. And I'm not sure if you've been to a reservation lately, but we have a lot of dogs. I hear Ben really likes dogs. And I could assure you, I'm not sure that we have a thing for dogs and is why we have a lot of dogs. I think dogs have a thing for us. On the reservation, we just had a tribe of dogs. And my brothers and sisters, who were actually my cousins, we all grew up with grandma and grandpa, who just loved animals, horses, cows, and dogs. And, we would give our dogs Indian names, believe it or not, and we'd name our dogs after other animals. So we had squirrel, monkey, tiger, chicken, and Jeff. <laughs> Jeff is not named after me. He was actually named after a second grade teacher who came to school one time with a hickey and a black eye. And when we asked him about it, he said it was Valentine's Day. <laughs> Whatever that meant. But the dog, the dog was pretty shaggy and a little scruffy just as well. And when we weren't herding dogs, we would be hanging out with our grandma and grandpa, and they were incredible folks. My grandfather was a fisherman on the Columbia River, and my grandmother supported his life by also digging and uh, picking berries from the mountains, and when we would be in her longhouse drying foods and getting ready for the seasons to come, she would share these amazing, beautiful stories, which I'll share a couple with you now. But she would start with, A long time ago, all of the people that came, they didn't look like us. They were the sun, the moon, the stars, they were the air, there were the seasons. There were also this rock with a heartbeat inside. There was only two seasons, though, in that time. 
there was winter and summer. And every time the sun would come, this rock with a heartbeat would get really hot and burn. And whenever the sun would go down, then the rock would get really cold and freeze. But no matter what, there would be this amazing heartbeat that came right from the ground, right from this rock. And so they had many conversations in that time. And again, these people did not look like us. And they would talk about life and subsistence and resiliency. And so as time went on, they said, we should have two more seasons. And they would argue about the seasons and said, no, it should be cold all the time. And then another one would chime in and they would say, no, it should be hot all the time. Eventually, they created spring and fall. And with that, we can now have moisture that would come from the air, come out of the clouds and land on the land and be able to stay on top and go into the ground. Well, in that experience, then more life started to take form here on this earth, on this beautiful rock with a heartbeat. And so these people did not look like us. These people came in the form of plants and flowers and bushes and trees and right through the breeze and the leaves, they would feel these harmonies that would come. And they didn't always just go with the heartbeat. Sometimes they would just be a melody. Oh, 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 of the plants and all of the bushes and the trees. They learned the language. They began to introduce themselves. All of them were saying, I am rock, I am flower, I am the tree. And they would share the language and all these experiences that they would see this earth coming to life. And now with more seasons, these plants had to follow the seasons. These plants would change their entire body, their leaves and their petals, and they would fall to the ground, and some of them would sleep during certain seasons, and some of them would change and wake up in the spring and dry up and get ready to come back. Year after year, they would follow the season people. And after many generations, there was more people arrived. People were swimming in the waters, and people started exploring the shores and started looking around. They had eyes and mouths and tails and began to grow paws and claws, and be, they began to see that this world was constantly changing, and beneath their feet, they would feel this beautiful, beautiful heartbeat, and sometimes they would hear the melody. captivated by this melody that came naturally from the earth and from the soil and the breeze. And they would begin to talk with the people that were already there, the plants and the berries and the trees. And they would understand the language and how important it was to follow the seasons. And so these animals started to change themselves. Some of them would change their fur and their paws, and some of them would sleep in different seasons. Some of them would bury their foods deep underground. They were all in tune with the fact that everything was connected in this beautiful world and environment. In exploration, the bear decided to go out exploring and found the huckleberry. He tasted it and he loved it. He ate all the huckleberries he could find in the Cascade Mountains. So much berries he ate that he was full. Berries were on his paws and his claws and his teeth and his face. And all the animals called the bear to this great council for him to answer for what he was doing to the huckleberry. And the poor huckleberry was just timid and couldn't find other places to grow. All the bushes were destroyed. And Anahui was sitting there all fat and full. And so they were 
right there with the bear and the huckleberries. And the animals asked bear to answer for what he had done to the huckleberry. And all he had to say was, I like them. And out of concern for huckleberry, the animal said, but if you keep eating all the huckleberries, there's none for the soil, there's none for the breeze, and the air, and all the other animals that depend on the huckleberry. You need to give something to the huckleberry for him to watch over himself. Look for other places to grow in the forest. And the bear says, I have nothing to give. All I have is my paws, and my claws, and my teeth, and my fur. And so the, bear, the animals started to whisper to each other. So the deer spoke up and said, we think you ought to give him one of your eyeballs. And the bear said, how can I live with one eyeball? I'll be running into the bushes and the trees and the rocks and whatever else is out there. And so the animals whispered again. We think you ought to give him just a little bit of eyesight for him to be able to look around in the forest and look after himself and find other places to grow. And so Anahui, the bear, he thought of it and looked at the huckleberry, and the huckleberry thought it was a good idea. So the bear started singing his powerful song. And he gave it to the huckleberry, and the huckleberry gladly accepted. And so the berry gave him permission to eat all the huckleberries he would like. And for that, the huckleberry gets to travel around in his belly, and whenever the bear decides to make a number two, he's planted in the forest somewhere. And that's their partnership. And so from then on, every huckleberry has one eye on every berry that he got from the bear who no longer sees very well, so he gets around with his nose. All of those people began to share all of the things that they had witnessed. They had even witnessed this incredible person that grew so high in the sky that they could see the stars in the day. She was so tall, she had this long white hair that went all the way down to the canyons and the valleys and the streams and the creeks and the rivers. She was so tall, she never argued with any of the other mountain people. Everyone respected her because of how much nutrients and life she gave to such a region. She was so tall until one day she started to get sick all of the people witnessed her started to shake. And then after a while, you could still just hear the heartbeat. But then she would shake again. All of the people were beginning to become very concerned. She began to shake so hard, so hard. Everyone was concerned until she blew her top. And into the sky was ash and rock and fire. All of the people cringed at her power. The day turned to night. It was so dark for a long time. All of the people went into hiding until finally it was just the heartbeat that remained. All the animals began to look around and look in the sky. The dark clouds began to turn white and the blue began to come out. Everyone started shaking themselves off of dust and they started to look around and they looked over in her direction and she was no longer there. All that was there were three little peaks and they were like her children. They realized that she had become impregnated and she had given birth. And those three peaks ended to grow up into the beautiful women as their mother. 
And all of the people here have always referred to them as the Three Sisters or Tamima. And now it is Sisters Oregon. So our people now live on the Warm Springs Indian Reservation where we have to protect it. It's important we have rights to the land, we have rights to have a relationship to the plants and the seasons and the animals. And every once in a while, those rights are intruded upon. They're questioned. There was once this big lawyer that came to Warm Springs from Bend, right over here. He came on down, and he decided to bring his rifle. He saw a duck in the sky and shot it. And the poor thing came just dropping out of the sky and landed in an old man's yard. And so the lawyer drove over there with his bends and got to the front yard and proceeded to jump over the small fence of the old man's yard. And the duck was laying there, and the lawyer walked up, and he began to pick up the duck, and the old man came out of the door and said, Hey, what are you doing? That's my duck. And the lawyer says, Ah, uh, no, sir, I actually just shot this duck just a little bit ago. And the old man says, No, it's my duck in my yard on my reservation and the lawyer says you know I'm so-and-so from Bend Oregon and we've won many cases and I'm a big hot shot I obviously drive a Benz and the old man says I don't care who you are this duck has landed in my yard and it's my duck and the lawyer is like no it is my duck and so the old man says, you know what, let's settle this like men. And the lawyer raises his eyebrows and says, okay. You know, being a younger lawyer, handsome looking fella, and an elder man, a little shorter than him, and he says, how do we do this like men? And the old man says, we're going to have a race, a physical race. And whoever can make the best time in this race they can get this duck. Okay, what's this race about? And the old man says, we're going to run through this puddle of mud, through the grass, over the fence, one foot in a cow pie, kick one ball of horse dung, cross the creek into the hay pile, run on back, slap the lamb on the butt, and we'll time you. And you're going to go first. And so the lawyer actually is like, this is going to be easy. Sure. And so he's like, all right. So he takes his mark. He gets set. And the old man gives him the start to go. And this old, this lawyer takes off running through the mud, th over the fence, into the cow pie, kicks the horse dung, crosses the river, into the hay, runs back, and actually it takes him two minutes. He's covered in mud. He's got poop on both feet. He's got hay coming all over him. He's looking at the old man, and he says, all right, your turn. And the old man says, oh, you can have the duck. I want to thank you all for coming out this evening. I appreciate your presence, and I look forward to seeing you again. Uh, Bend is a place we've called Pushwai for many, many years. Pushwai is reference to the various rocks throughout the area. Pushwai. So thank you all, and I'll see you again. Good evening. Welcome to the 19th annual A Novel Idea Read Together. And it is so wonderful to be here with you all after two years. It's wonderful that we can gather. And thank you to Jason Green uh, for his amazing performance. Jefferson. Oh, sorry, Jefferson Green. I can't read my own writing. What a beautiful way to kick off the evening. Um, I wanted to honor and share Mr. Green's background with you all. Jefferson was born and raised on the Warm Springs Indian Reservation. As a young artist, he was immersed in rituals administered by his elders. 
Today, Jefferson apprentices under several first uh, language speakers of the Warm Springs, Yakima, and Umatilla, Umatilla Indian Reservation, and provides each each kin, sorry, Ikishin, workshops, stories, games, dances, songs, and arts to students young and experienced. So thank you, Jefferson, for sharing your talents with us this evening. So today we gather to celebrate two wonderful books, The Seed Keeper by uh, Diane Wilson, and I Can Make This Promise by Christine Day. Christine Day. We are excited to have both authors with us here in conversation with Gabrielle Hall. Gabrielle will share more about the authors in just a little bit. This year, we came together as a community to learn, listen, and understand one another a little bit deeper, and we explored these two wonderful books. We had many partners and esteemed experts from Central Oregon and across the uh, country who led 20 cultural programs. The cultural programs included tonight's author presentation, including tonight's author presentations, are free and open to all people in Deschutes County. The Library Foundation makes this possible by raising every dollar needed to pay for the programs and the author's visits. We have several generous and loyal sponsors who have been supporting a novel idea during the past 18 years, including the Roundhouse Foundation, the E.H. and M.E. Bowerman Advised Fund, of the Oregon Community Foundation, and Lonza Pharma and Biotech. So thank you, sponsors. In addition, we have these amazing long-term, to these amazing long-term sponsors, we are pleased to announce generous support from RBC Wealth Management Foundation and the Oregon Humanities. So thank you both. We are also grateful to our bookstore partners, Sun River Books and Music, Barnes and Noble, Herringbone Books, Polina Spring Books, and Roundabout Books. All right. We are also fortunate to have the incredible support of community readers from across Deschutes County who bring forth books for the final advisory committee to read and review. Together, our local readers and the advisory committee helps the library decide the best books for our community. Please see their names in your program. We are grateful for their dedication and focus. And shout out to all the volunteers, Bend High staff, and the Deschutes Public Library staff who worked tirelessly to organize this incredible event. Thank you all. We were privileged to have six esteemed advisors throughout the planning of A Novel Idea 2022. Michelle, Michelle Carey of the Native American Program Coordinator at COCC, John Riggs, Rachel Broder, Jalen Supa, Valerie Switzer, Switzler, Karina Miller, and uh, so thank all of them. Uh, for helping us with this great evening and these events this week, this month. At our first meeting, our advisors asked us to one, not look away from the hard things, two, look at the native experience, both past and present, and three, three focus on the joy and the resilience of native communities. We hope the Novel Idea programs, book discussions, and tonight's presentations honor these three tenants. A few housekeeping details. Uh, please walk up to the mics that will be in the aisles uh, after the discussion to share your questions. Book sales and signings will occur in the lobby following the question and answers. Uh, thanks to Polina Springs Books for their support of the book sales. And please remember to turn off your cell phones. Thank you. All right. It is an honor to introduce our host for the evening, Gabriana Hall. Ms. Hall is an enrolled member of the Klamath Tribes. She was born and raised in the Fort Klamath Valley and attended school in Chillicothe, Oregon. She earned a Bachelor's of Science in Eth Ethnic Studies, a Master's, Master of Arts in Interdisciplinary Studies, and later a Master's of Arts in Teaching from Oregon State University. 
She currently teaches ethnic studies and native studies at Central Oregon Community College. Ladies and gentlemen, Gabrielle Hall. Galasasis, Supketcha. Welcome and thank you for coming. I want to take a moment to acknowledge the work of the committee and the Deschutes County Library in giving voices to Native people. That's not something that you've always seen. I grew up two hours south of here in Chelequin, Oregon, and my high school was 50% Native. And we went to, when we would go to the library, we would not find books by Indigenous authors. And so, and we also weren't taught Native history. And when you kind of have this complete void of you in important subjects, such as in a library, in your history class, it makes you reflect on how you see yourself, how you see your family, how you see your tribe, and how you see your community. It makes you feel that those are not of value because it's people in a position of power, or an institution like a library, which is a place of learning, that doesn't show value to that. And so you reflect that internally that you must not be of value. And so to have the honor and the privilege to be a part of this programming where for a month straight, Deschutes County got hit with Native history over and over, Native storytelling, you guys got it all. And that will change the lens through which you view the world. It changes the lens through which Native people view themselves. And so to some people, they may just think this as a book. But to other people, this reflects our history. And I really like the tenant that the committee had. Don't look away when it's hard. This history is sometimes hard to talk about. Yet these esteemed authors taught history in a storytelling way that made you turn to the next page, even though you knew sometimes it might be pretty, not be pretty on the next page. And I <clears throat> marvel at their storytelling ability to teach tough subjects in a way that made us want to learn. And I'm thankful for that because they reshaped the way we will see the world from now on. And I also like that they are spreading awareness and acknowledgement of what has happened. As Diane would probably say, she is planting seeds of truth of, about our history. And now it's your responsibility. You have learned. You need to water these seeds. Don't let the learning stop here. And something I've got to know these authors just in the last couple of hours, and I'm honored and privileged to share the stage with them tonight. But something that they do is they're not just blazing the trail for women authors or indigenous women in, in particular, but as they blaze that trail, they're extending a hand back to their communities. And I think that's important. And I think these books are the seeds of healing in indigenous communities. And so I am so pleased to be able to welcome them here to Deschutes County. And I'd like to begin with Diane Wilson. She's a Dakota. She uses her personal experience to illustrate broader social and historical content. Wilson's memoir, Spirit Car, Journey of a Dakota Past, won the 2006 Minnesota Book Award. And her nonfiction book, Beloved Child, A Dakota Way of Life, was awarded the 2012 Barbara Sudler Award from His History Colorado. She is an enrolled member of the Rosebud Reservation, and I welcome you today, Diane. <laughs> Our other esteemed guest is Christine Day. She is a citizen of the Upper Skagit Indian Tribe, she grew up in Seattle, nestled between the sea, the mountains, and the passages of her favorite book. Her debut novel, I Can Make This Promise, was a best book of the year from Kirkus, School Library Journal, NPR, and the Chicago Public Library, as well as a Charlotte Huck Award Honor Book, and an American Indian Youth Literature Award Honor Book. Christine <laughs> I can talk loud, too. Lives in the Pacific Northwest with her family. Welcome, Christine. Um, 
we are going to have the mics open at a later time for you to ask questions, but one of the things that we noticed is in reading these books, if you read both of them, they had some commonalities, and so we wanted to focus on some of the commonalities of the books together. And Christine starts her book. Her first chapter is titled, <laughs> Where Are You From? And so I'd like both of you to answer that question. Where are you from? from? Diane, do you want to start? Mm. Uh, I'm a Takiapi. Diane Wilson, Namakiapia, Bide Wakantwan Oyate Hamatahaya, Sichangu Oyate Edo Mawapia. So in for me, that is the a traditional way of, of telling you in Dakota where I'm from. Uh, my name is Diane Wilson. I am a descendant of the Bide Wakantwan Dakota Oyate in central south central Minnesota, and I'm also enrolled on the Rosebud Reservation. So what I'm telling you in my introduction is a little bit about my family history. So the fact that we are from uh, Dakota Oyate tells you that it, it, it actually tells a little family history going back to the 1862 Dakota War. And then as our family moved around, we, we became enrolled on the Rosebud Reservation, which is more of a political statement about where we're from. So that's one way to answer, um, and I'm from Minnesota. <laughs> I should mention that. <laughs> yeah, so, and I, I do want to thank um, everyone, this incredible group of people who have put together this, this program, which I understand is in its 19th year, and it, it, it's just phenomenal. So I just, I want to say thank you um, for the invitation to be here, to be part of it. It's just an honor. Mm -hmm. I am also going to just echo some gratitude here for a moment and say that I'm equally excited and so honored to be here. And it is so incredible to see so many people here joining us today. And um, I am a citizen of the Upper Skagit Tribe, which is one of the small Coast Salish nations in Western Washington State. I'm also the daughter of a pre-Indian Child Welfare Act adoptee. And so, for me and for my mother, um, it has been a kind of long journey to return to Native communities and to really learn more about where we are from. And um, yeah, a lot of that you kind of see reflected in my first book, especially because I share a lot in common with Edie. And I grew up in the Seattle area. I grew up in a pretty suburban neighborhood and had a pretty happy childhood, but I was always sort of plagued by a lot of questions about where I was from and received a lot of questions about where I'm from too. And so, yeah, it is one of those things that I think everyone kind of goes on their own individual journeys, unpacking that probably over the course of our entire lives, we come up with different answers and different ways of understanding who we are and where we come from, and maybe even more importantly, where we're going. So, um, yeah, that's a little bit about where I'm from, and I'm so honored to be here, and, yeah, excited to be in conversation with these two. Thank you. Both books speak to gardens and their importance. Can you tell us what this meant for your characters and for you? Do you want to, you want to go first, Christine? Uh, sure. So there are some scenes where you see Edie's mother planting in her garden that is just a garden that they have at their house. And it's something that Edie kind of draws some inspiration from in her sketchbook. And... Um, I just think that that was kind of an interesting way. I think that gardens are such a, it's a way to work directly with the land and to sort of reconnect with the land in a very physical and tactile manner. And when you do practices like that, it just inspires you to kind of care more for that place that you belong to. And so for me, I wanted to show that as just like a small space that they had in common as a place where they were able to plant seeds of you know, knowledge and of care and of compassion into their own little uh, yard. And 
it was also significant to you, I think, for E to kind of draw some of the camas. And there are moments later on in the book where you kind of, where there are conversations she has with her mom about drawing and creating art that is inspired by landscapes and is inspired by real settings and real places, which um, was maybe a little bit of a meta moment for me <laughs> in the book because um, I, it was a very regionally specific book and I do reference a lot of very real places with really deep histories and um, it was all stuff that I learned as I learned those histories and made these reconnections with Native communities and nations. And as I've kind of grown up and learned more about the, the places in the Seattle area and what they looked like in the not so recent past versus what they look like now and how the West in general here in America, the American West is kind of and a lot of popular art is really depicted as almost like a place that was waiting to be settled, as like this wilderness that didn't have significant populations or history until uh, recently, which is so not true. And so, yeah, I suppose kind of through that garden was kind of ultimately a minor place in a minor setting in the book, and yet it holds a lot of that kind of weight and a lot of that metaphorical significance, for sure. So that is kind of how I would answer that. Well, would I, would I really resonate with what you were saying? Am, am, am I on? Come on. OK. <laughs> oh. All right, I'm in and out. Um, <laughs> What, what I was really resonating with what you were saying is this idea of there's the relationship with garden and mm -hmm. seeds and plants, but there's also garden as metaphor. So especially in a book, you know, I think a garden is such a powerful tool for not only giving your character an activity and a way of engaging with the earth and with seeds, but also as you show that, um, how gardens have evolved over time. It's also a really powerful lesson in the way that relationship with the earth has shifted. So in my book, the, the main character, Rosalie, is, for me, she represented the, the member of that family out of the four Dakota voices, um, the member of the family who had come really as far as assimilation could take a family. So she's lost her language, she has lost her family. She has, she's not connected to her community. And, and she doesn't have any connection at all to seeds, even though, as we know as the reader from other voices in that story, seeds have been really important to this family for many generations. But it's reached the point in Rosalie's life where she has no connection to them. And so it was that opportunity to engage her back in gardening and to show that when we reconnect with that relationship, that it's also a way of bringing us home. That, that you know, sometimes we think about um, cultural identity as being specific to, say, language or enrollment, but there is something about really re-engaging with seeds and plants and our foods that is also a way that brings us home and helps us re-engage with that cultural identity. So that's a big, <laughs> that's a, that's a big way of talking about garden. Oh, I love her. She <laughs> actually planted also. <laughs> there you go. Um, you just hit right on our next question. The importance of returning home or coming back home. Why is this so important to Native people or just people in general? Um, but you started to go there. I did start to go there. Yeah. Uh, I'll just keep going there. There you then. go. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, you know, I guess for me, growing up in Minnesota, uh, we weren't taught history of what happened to Dakota people, um, especially around the 1862 Dakota War when the Dakota were removed from Minnesota. And that's something that hasn't been taught in our schools. So I find that stories um, are an, one way to also convey a lot of history so that people understand 
um, much on a much deeper level what's happened to Native people within your own region, within your own um, state. And so for me, that process of cultural recovery is all about coming home. And so the, um, and, and um, you know, relearning languages, language revitalization is one of the really powerful ways that we can, we can um, rebuild and reclaim cultural identity. But actually also reclaiming our indigenous foods is another really powerful way. And along with that, it's reclaiming that relationship with the earth. So, so much of the novel is about looking at how that relationship has evolved over time as a, as a, um, as a consequence of assimilation policies and that in re-engaging with the practice of growing our own food and understanding um, how our ancestors uh, had what their what their relationship was to the earth is a is a really powerful way to also reclaim your cultural identity. So that for me is what coming home is about. Mm. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Um, I think in addition to everything Diane just teased out there about cultural recovery, reclaiming languages, reclaiming food sovereignty, and relationships with the land. I think also this theme of coming home is, has so much to do with um, what was already kind of hinted at earlier about n not being afraid of having difficult conversations and about kind of finding ways to um, speak about that trauma or whatever it is that has happened in the past or how families are kind of still healing and learning and moving forward in different ways. And coming home is about sort of creating a brighter future for each other, right? It's just, it's just as much about like being at one with your family again and about creating positive relationships that can really foster growth for all those other, for all the cultural recovery and everything else to then follow. Um, so I think that in my book, uh, basically the, the whole plot and premise is the, dis the discovery in the attic and the mystery that follows and Edie's kind of way of going about learning this stuff kind of on her own. So much of it comes from the fact that her parents just don't want to have this difficult conversation with her. And it's because they think that they're protecting her and they think that um, at that particular time, that's just their choice. And it is one of those things where at what point do we stop protecting each other and we start to trust that we can handle these difficult truths and create something better together to create a better home for one another. Um, so that's kind of, yeah, I think that's a big, part of my book for sure because by the end by the end of the story they do literally return to a home that has been in with held within their family for a long time and it takes a lot for them to get there but a lot of it comes down to being willing to confront the past and being willing to confront your trauma and feel that loss but then make it through together because that's the only way anyone ever makes it through trauma really is by trusting other people your loved ones to hold you through it so of course i am you don't even need to ask because i read this amazing book and just loved it and what what really struck one of the things that struck me about your Edie character is that the um so there were generations that have been silenced so my parents' generation, uh, my grandparents, who for whom when they were growing up it was too dangerous to even claim to be a native person, and so um, a lot of stories, a lot of traditions were were we'll say displaced. I don't want ever want to say knowledge is lost, but it was displaced and it was silenced. Mm -hmm. And so what was so um, wonderful to see in the Edie character is her courage in pushing back against the silence. And that's what I see happening now 
with um, another generation of writers is bringing those stories back out, breaking open that silence. And sometimes uh, maybe you don't have the family to go to or the family mm -hmm. doesn't even know, but you could, as a writer, recreate that knowledge, that history. So that's what, one of the things I love about this book. Thank you. Thank you, Danny. Um, one of the things, I think you guys are getting there, so I'm just going to jump ahead to it. Um, but both of the books address um, not tr just tribal history, but they both address specifically the Indian Child Welfare Act. And when I teach this subject to my college students, I say this is not a history that's far away. This is something that every single Native family has a cousin, a brother, somebody is involved in the Indian Child Welfare Act mm -hmm. process. And so it's hard to talk about, hard to teach, because you're not removed there's no time lapse in the removal of that. But can you guys tell me um, what made you choose to focus on this specific piece of legislation and its impact on your life or Native communities? Mm -hmm. um, and why, I want to tell you where I'm going with it so you can uh -huh. kind of frame, this, frame your answer. But the Indian Child Welfare Act is being challenged in the Supreme Court this fall as being unconstitutional. And so I think it's important that we know why these authors, they had choice in what they chose to write about. And both of them chose to focus on this act as one of the things they talked about. And so knowing that that's kind of where we're headed by the fall, but why did you guys make this conscious choice to dig in on this piece of legislation? Hmm. Don't fight over who can go uh, first. <laughs> you know, it's, you both uh, look like you're pretty. It's such a Good big question, um, and I'll I'll will just say that um, uh, in, for me throughout the books that I've written, once I once I understood the history, once I had done the the work to understand uh, who my family was and how we had become who we are through the impact of assimilation policies and in particular boarding schools, and to understand the impact on Native families to have children forcibly removed for decades, and then to go through a period of time in which um, social workers came in and scooped children out of the families. And, and that, um, that's, I, to me, some of the most devastating history that we carry as Native communities is the fact that our children were taken from us and that we live in a country in which only some children are protected and so that, in, in every book that I've written, um, there has been a theme about how we get back to being the kind of society that protects all children. Because mm -hmm. I can't think of any higher purpose for us as human beings than to make sure that we create a world in which all children have that opportunity to be safe and to thrive. And so ICWA, is one of the ways in which we try to reestablish that protection for Native children that has um, not been present for many years. Um, and so it, it, it's a way of beginning to undo some of the damages that have been inflicted on Native families. Thank you. Yeah, no higher purpose. It's so true. Uh -huh. um, well, I decided to address this particular piece of legislation, this bit of history, partially because, as I said, my mother was a pre-Indian Child Welfare Act adoptee. And I actually was the one who got to tell her as when I was in college, and I was doing a lot of research and kind of doing a lot of my own learning, that her story was not unique because she had thought that it was. Mm. and. I think that that's another real piece of this is that these types of assimilation projects and things that happened in the past uh, before there were protections like the Indian Child mm -hmm. Welfare Act, so much of its purpose was to make people feel like they were really alone. alone. You know, my mom grew up in this world that just felt like she didn't fit in anywhere. And um, she had no idea that she was one in three, that what had happened to her, what she thought was just this kind of like 
tragic thing, which even when she did reconnect with her, her native family, her biological family that she found later on in life, it was, it's a lot of trauma to move past. And there was a lot of hurt still that was, um, you know, I'm, we are still, we are connected with them and it's been a long road with that too. But um, it's one of those things that was just so difficult. And I think it was really difficult for her. And I think that for me, um, when I started writing this book and I got this idea to create it when Edie's voice first kind of popped into my head and then never really went away, um, I just really wanted to give my mom and myself a story to bond over. And it was a real emotional catharsis for us mm. both, I think, because she told me that she learned a lot from it and that she didn't realize just how deeply that history and her adoption and the stuff that she had carried herself impacted me and my sister as well. And which is maybe a little bit silly, like, of course, mom. But, <laughs> um, but for her, it really made it feel that much more real. And I think it was a real healing process for us both. So I wrote it to bring awareness to something I thought was really worthwhile to be shared with young readers and in schools. It's something that, you know, kids and their teachers can talk about in class and kind of really discuss why is this such a sort of buried history? Why is it something that wasn't taught in classes for so long? Um, it's a book that has been added to curriculum in a few different districts now that I've learned about. And I think that's really incredible because Again, if we don't talk about it, how could we possibly learn and move forward and make sure that some of these mistakes and things that happened in the past aren't replicated in the future? And um, at the time that I wrote it, I had heard about some kind of specific cases where parts of the Indian Child Welfare Act were being challenged. But now the fact that it is being challenged in this much bigger way. And this is a book that came out very recently. It came out in 2019. Um, I did not expect it to escalate that fast. I couldn't have, obviously. And so um, it is one of those things I, yeah, I don't really know what else to say aside from the fact that it's something I felt was so important and was such a big part of my life and my education as a young woman. And a bonding experience for me and my mom and something I hope a lot of other readers from all walks of life will understand and will understand why it matters and will help like in solidarity to keep protections like this in the real world because even though these are fictional stories they talk about real places and real people and real things that are worth fighting for so Thank you both for giving voice to that issue. I think it's one, to, so they know they're not alone. And I think that's something that um, a lot of people probably deal with and they can put themselves in these characters' shoes now, so thank you. Um, being in the Pacific Northwest, we all know water is a hot topic. And so thank you for the rain. Um, but the role of water in both of your books, I felt like it was consciously done. And so what was that water character and why did it come, keep reoccurring? And how did you decide to focus water? Well, do you wanna go? Oh, sure, I'll start with this one. So, well, for me, I think that in one way that I'll just kind of focus on is that I think that what's really interesting about bodies of water, whether it's, you know, the Puget Sound in Western Washington or the entire oceans, um, you can kind of think of like waterways as barriers of separation between land and between people, or you can think of them as connecting bodies, as something that literally bridges the entire world and flows and keeps knowledge and people and ideas, everything moving, and it brings us all back to one another. And so for me, um, 
specifically a body of water that was really important in Edie's story, which she and her family eventually do cross and make it to the other side. Um, the entire time, it's, it was a connecting piece between a place that she regularly would go, like Golden Gardens Park, which was like one of her favorite places to draw, one of her favorite places to be, with, and then Indianola on the other side of the water, which turns out to have this really rich history. It was the, his, the historic site of Old Man House, one of the oldest longhouse winter villages for the Suquamish community was right there on that beach. And that is where Chief Seattle himself had lived for many years. And there's all this history, all this knowledge, all this deep connection right there, right across the water. And it was right across from her the whole time, like her whole life. It was just a matter of, you know, making it across, but it was always connected and it was never gone. So for me, when I use bodies of water in my work, that is really how I tend to think about it, is not as things that separate people, but as connecting bodies always, that it is something that never fails to bring people together, so. Yeah. Um, so water, I think of water as, um, well, so what I've been taught is that water is our first medicine. So water is sacred. And in our area, Minnesota and the Dakotas, for the past several years, we have really been battling against the pipeline. So I'm sure many of you are familiar with what happened at Standing Rock and the battle that indigenous communities have had in protecting their water. Mm -hmm. And um, the saying, mini Wachoni, which is water is life. And so to bring that into uh, my novel, it was a way of making that connection. So with the, there's the focus on seeds and the, the understanding that in the original agreement between human beings and seeds that, um, that we had agreed to take care of seeds and they take care of us. And by extension, I also wanted to show that original agreement as, as being connected to water. Oh, it's, I'm just a problem. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, so that the, we begin to see also through, the, through this metaphorical relationship that these are the seeds, the water, the, the land, all of these things are sacred beings and that we have a responsibility as human beings to take care of them, to, um, to show our gratitude for them by living in a reciprocal relationship. So the water in my story is a really important um, presence to, to show that original medicine, but also to show that responsibility and that gratitude. Um, that all of, all of these things are really important for us to take care of. Thank you. So this is just a little question. How do you name your characters or what significance does that naming hold um, to you or to the character and what's your process in doing that? Do you wanna go ahead, Christy? Sure. Um, well, for my main characters, I mostly go off of intuition. I don't really, I, I do some research, I research the meanings of names and things like that, but for me, Edie, it was just, it fit her. I don't know how else to explain it. Okay. It was just the perfect name for her. And um, I really wanted a name that was kind of, you know, old fashioned, something that would could be tied back to being named after someone who came from a couple generations before, but mostly it was just that it fit her. And then for all the other characters, I tend to do a lot more work where I will do research about names that are popular around the time they would have been born, for example. Um, so I look at a lot of different kind of like name trends over time. And another thing that I try to be really purposeful about is mixing them up so that each character name, we don't have a lot of repetition with like starting with the same letter, for example, or the same kind of number of syllables or the same length. I try to make it really 
everyone has their own distinct name. That's kind of my process and how I go about it. So yeah, that's kind of how I approach naming my characters. Uh -huh. <laughs> so I have a, well, it's kind of um, maybe an intuitive, similar. Yeah. Um, so some of them, I found that in trying to develop characters, it was really helpful to start with, if I knew somebody who would maybe be part of that character. So, um, so Rosalie, for example, that's an old family name, and the name Gabby. That is that's that that's because I've known two Gabbies, and they were just fierce. So I thought <laughs> this woman has to be a Gabby, because <laughs> they are you know they're activists, outspoken, strong Native women, and so that was the easy one. And then so that's kind of how I build it. Just I look at. Who could I who could I borrow from, and then you know start attaching other things to them? But I like I like your tips. Oh, thank yeah, you. I remember that. I like <laughs> your note about Gabby's because that's my experience oh, too. Yes, yeah. <laughs> so, <laughs> they're fierce. I always tell people you can call me Gabrielle or Abby, oh. just don't call me Gabby. Oh. But I'm gonna change it. I'm now gonna let people call me Gabby if I could be serious. We're renaming you tonight. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> Thank you. I've always wondered how people do that, so thanks for sharing. Um, Diane, we were going to ask if you would read a section of your book. Um, and it's actually the section after the fire, when Rosalie saves the seed, she calls Gabby to explain. And so we were going to have Diane read that for us. You can believe this or not, Gabby said, choosing her words carefully. But there are times when women have to make hard decisions, choices that are sometimes unforgivable. We have to see beyond and be prepared to do whatever is needed to save our people, even if it breaks our hearts. My grandmother had a soul of iron from what her life cost her. It takes courage to do what you did. In another time, that act might have saved your family or even your tribe. So what, what were you thinking when you wrote that? And then what are those hard choices that we've made in the past, the present, and we will be challenged with in the future? Um, so there was a, the, one of the original inspirations for this book was a story that I heard when I was participating on the Dakota Commemorative March. And that, that was actually in 2002. And that was to honor the 1,700 Dakota women, children, and elders who were force marched um, 150 miles and then removed from the state. So the story that, so the march that I was on, we were following that original path and um, planting prayer stakes and remembering the, the names of those original marchers. But the story that I was told was that because the women didn't know where they were being sent or how they were gonna feed their families, they sowed their seeds in the hems of their skirts and they hid them in their pockets so that no matter where they were going, they would have something to plant in the coming season. And, and I thought, you know, and that story really hit me that these women had that presence of mind to sow those seeds and make sure that they protected them but during that removal, when families were, were, were hungry, when their children were starving, they had to save those seeds. And so if you can imagine being one of those mothers and having to make a choice between future generations and food that you're gonna need um, in future years or that choice between feeding your child, your family right now. So that, that to me is an example of um, the stories that I've learned about the ways in which sometimes you have to think about the good of your community. You have to think in that, in that bigger picture sense about how you protect your people. And sometimes it might be at the cost of your own family. And, and think of the strength that it would take to make that kind of courageous decision. And um, I think that, that Native women continue to face those decision, decisions today, just given the, um, the challenges that our communities and especially our young people are facing. You know, the fact that Native young people have the highest rate of suicide in the country, 
that to me is a symptom of the trauma that has been passed down through generations. And so how do, how do, families, how do families try to heal that trauma? How do they, what, what choices can they make now? What can they do to help um, restore the health of their families? I think, Christine, for the, the challenges that Native women have faced in the past, the present, or will face. I don't know how I'm going to top that answer. Um, <laughs> I mean, not that I'm trying to top any of your answers. Most <laughs> keeping score. <laughs> I just don't. Oh, that was so eloquent and beautiful. <laughs> um, I guess it is just, as Diane said, women have to think in the long term. And sometimes that's really hard. And sometimes there aren't any easy answers or paths to go down. And um, yeah, I... I don't know. Native women just do amazing things all the time. <laughs> and, and I'm really, <laughs> and I'm really <laughs> in awe of the choices that they make. And um, yeah, I, I don't know. That's just it. <laughs> so, Christine, I was looking at your website, and you tell the story about how you were in an ethnic studies class. Woo -woo. And you're going across the um, Puget Sound, and you were kind of doing a get to know you. And they asked you the question, what do you carry with you? And you gave an answer, and you immediately wanted to redo it. But I think these books add a weight to both of you, a good and a bad weight. But what do you carry with you, and how have these books carried or changed the load or made it different? No redoing, though. You only get one shot. <laughs> right. <laughs> well, yeah, the question, you're so close. The question was, who do you carry with you, that they asked. And, um, yeah, we basically, it was a group of us, American Indian Studies students, and we were a small group, all just sitting in this makeshift circle in these bolted-down seats. And... I started talking, and it's true, like in, a, in any icebreaker, you can't say everything. And it was a, a seed, certainly, of what sort of inspired or propelled me to continue on with Edie's story was that particular field trip, which we did take across from the Edmonds Kingston Ferry to Indianola. It's the same trip that Edie takes with her parents towards the end of the book almost exactly, because we went to the historic site of Old Man House, and we were hosted by a Suquamish elder, and we went to the Suquamish Museum, and it was just a trip that really fundamentally changed how I viewed the Seattle coastlines around me, and how I really started to ask myself that question all the time of, who do I carry with me? Who am I representing right now? when I sit here in front of all of you folks. And um, so honestly, the weight of that for me, it just made me want to rise up and really represent my people and my family well in every situation that I go in. And writing this, writing Edie's story, writing this book, it didn't really, it was actually a lifting more so than a weight because it really did, as I said, it was an emotional catharsis for me and my mom. It was such a bonding experience for us. And so many of the conversations I've had with folks who have read it, whether they're native or non-native or whether they're older readers or really young readers who ask some of the best questions and relate to Edie in ways that are so profound to me. Um, I really feel like this story and this opportunity to write this book and to have it published in the way that it was published um, was a real blessing. And it was one that I definitely had to fight for. There were a lot of 
rejections along the way. And there were also editors who didn't really get what I was trying to do. Um, there's one particular story that I like to tell, which was of the very first time someone told me they wanted to publish my work and that they wanted to help me bring a version of this story into the world, but they asked if I would be willing to essentially rewrite the whole thing and set it, <laughs> <laughs> the whole thing, and set it in the past from Edie's mother's perspective instead of hers to make it a historical, a true historical fiction book set in like the 1970s or 80s. And um, I think there's a lot of really beautiful historical fiction out there. I think that um, historical fiction is really important and it matters, but it wasn't what I wanted to do. That was all I had growing up, was anytime there were Native characters at all, they were often in historical fiction, they were often very stereotypical and they did not feel true to me or my lived experiences or to anything I knew really about the world. And so, um, I basically had to summon the courage to tell that person no, even though it was the very first potential book contract I had after I had been trying to get published for a few years at that point. And um, I had to tell them no, because to me, the story could not exist without Edie. She was the whole heart of the book. And it mattered to me that it was a contemporary story. It is so modern, it is narrated in the present tense. That mattered, and it had to be a girl who learns from the past but is looking toward the future. So, yeah, for me, the fact that I was able to tell this story the way that I wanted to tell it, the fact that the money I made from this book helped me put a roof over my little family's head, and the fact that it has only really been a blessing to me um, has not felt like a weight at all. Who do you carry with you, Diane? Um, well, the so the story that I, I mentioned earlier about <clears throat> the Dakota women hiding those seeds in the hems of their skirts and in their pockets. And when I heard that story and realized I'm hearing that for the first time and I, I live in Minnesota, I grew up there, and yet we were not taught this history. And so the story of those Dakota women, if, if it hadn't been told and retold, then it would have been lost. And we would not, and their efforts, their courage, their strength, um, we wouldn't know that today, and we need those. We need those role models. We need those teachings that if we're, if we're going to figure out how to take care of the earth the way we need to be doing it, I look to what those women did. Look at the way that they were, how much they were willing to sacrifice to take care of those seeds. And so for me, the, in writing this book, one of the most important reasons for me to write it was to bring that story forward, to lift up those women and, and what they had done to protect seeds that we now have to plant today. So I actually have that Dakota corn that I write about. I plant that in my own garden. And the reason I plant it is that so I remember every season what those women did. So for me, this book is a way to, to make sure that I'm passing on this, gen, this knowledge this um, understanding that I've acquired over the, the years that I've been working with seeds onto an, another generation to, to make sure that it's not, it's not displaced, it's not set aside, and that those women are remembered. Um, both of your books talk about true harsh histories, but they both have a theme of hope. Why was that important to you? And why is that important to the indigenous community on a larger scale, that hope or resilience? Um, Diane looks like she's thinking, go ahead, Christine. <laughs> well, mine is a kid's book. So 
You can't really write a <laughs> Good book point. for well, for a children that doesn't end with hope. I think that's actually that's one of my favorite things about children's literature and about books for kids and young adults is the fact that you know kid characters aren't jaded yet, <laughs> and um, and and they shouldn't be because there is always hope to be found and. Um, yeah, I think that is just so beautiful. And for me, I mainly write Native characters, and I write Native characters in the way that I do because that is just kind of the truest way that I can bring my perspective into my stories, I think. And because I do try to, you know, teach and inform a long way with my books too, but not in a, not in a preachy way or not in a condescending way either. I just try to share things I'm really fascinated by. <laughs> and I try to make it really appeal to kids and to make them kind of curious about their own ancestors, their own histories, and the own people they are carrying with them because we all carry so much. And um, yeah, that hope is something that I just hope I can give to kids no matter what it is that they're experiencing and no matter what it is that they are turning to books for, you know, for comfort, for fun, for whatever it is. I just want them to feel that resounding sense of hope through every single book that I bring into the world. So. Well, I, I, hey, I think big kids need hope too. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and I... <laughs> yeah. I, I feel very hopeful, actually. I know that we have a, we have a lot of challenges um, in our communities and a lot of struggles, but I've seen change. I've seen change be possible. And what makes me especially hopeful was having worked um, for a nonprofit that, that uh, a nonprofit farm that actually taught Native youth how to, how to garden and how to take care of seeds and and to see the transformation in these youth from the time that they would arrive on the first day and, you know, asking them to eat vegetables, it was you. <laughs> and then see, watching them transform from these shy um, young people into leaders in their communities. And I see how uh, programs like learning to garden, learning your language, um, all of these cultural recovery efforts actually, actually work, that they are transformative. So what I, what I wanted to, to convey through this book is that um, despite the hard history that we carry, despite the challenges that we're facing today, if we're willing to do the work, if we're willing to make the commitment and really care about taking care of our children, taking care of the water and the earth and our seeds, that it's possible to make a change. And I think one of the ways that we do that is simply by rebuilding, reconnecting our relationship with what really matters. And so I want that to be the, the message of hope from my book. So my last question, Christine, you end your book with, where are you going? And I'm wondering, where are you two going? Where are you headed next? What should we be excited for? You want to tell us? Um, so I'm thinking about another novel. I've been asked a lot of questions about Thomas. <laughs> where is he going? And, and I explain that his character represents choice. So he's the metaphorical character that carries the choice that we all face. And, you know, to ask ourselves, which road are we on? And what, um, what are we upholding with each of these choices that we're make, making? So for me, it's, um, it, I'm really thinking about that next novel, and then just continuing to do this work of um, really wanting to help share the story of what it means to, to reconnect with that relationship with the earth and how important it is to us as human beings. So
So um, my next book is coming out next year. I'm very excited about it. It's going to be called We Still Belong. It's coming out in the summer of 2023. I don't know exactly when. We don't have a publishing date yet, but I'm going through some of the final kind of edits right now, right before we get sent off to copy edits and is printed into ARCs, which will then eventually become a final version of the book that is sent to bookstores and libraries all across the country. It's a pretty magical process, actually, how book production happens and how many people are involved and how many people it turns into such a passion project for so many people. And so right now, I'm really just like feeling that love and excitement in my little community with my pub team. And um, I'm really excited about this next book. I get asked a lot from kids, especially because they are just unafraid of asking really tricky questions. <laughs> um, the, one of my most common questions I get is, which book out of the ones you've written is your favorite? <laughs> <laughs> and um, my answer is always kind of the same but different because if I really had to choose, I would always say the book I wrote the most recently is my favorite because with each new book, I'm trying to really grow and change and challenge myself as a writer. And I kind of try to unlock new skills with each new one. And I set up some pretty specific challenges for myself with this next book. And... It's also, I think, maybe my most kind of lighthearted book yet, and it was a little bit kind of escapist for me because it's a book that I wrote during the pandemic, and it was also a book that I wrote during the first year of my daughter's life, which um, maybe I'm biased. I think that authors can be terrible judges of their own work, but I really think that you can feel that love for her that I had in my heart, like shining through in the text. So I'm very excited about it. And I'm really bad at talking about it though, about what it's <laughs> about. So I'll just tell you the title, which is We Still Long, coming out next year. And yeah, thanks. Very excited. <laughs> well, thank you so much. Those were my questions. <laughs> Sorry, I feel bad that I got to ask so many, and you guys like just get limited to one on the microphone. But does anybody have any questions for our guests? There's a hand over there. There's a hand. I thought I saw. Yep. Hello. Um, uh, <laughs> I was asking, uh, wondering, why you named the book, I Can Make This Promise? Oh, that's a great question. I will say, I really struggle with titles. Um, it was not initially called, I Can Make This Promise. It was something else, but something very different. And that was one of my first notes from my editor was, what if we called it something else? <laughs> and. Um, and then when I was still having a hard time coming up with uh, a really great, suitable title for it, she gave me this great piece of advice, which was, you know, as you go through with this next round of revisions and edits, just pay attention to the text and see if there are any words or phrases that stand out to you that could work as the title. And that was a great piece of advice, and I found it in the epilogue. It comes from a line in the epilogue towards the very end of the book. And when I saw those words, I can make this promise on the page, I was like, well, that will work. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Great question. Thank you. I have a question. <laughs> um, <laughs> what inspired you to write the part where... Um, where she got frustrated with her friend and like they weren't like really friends anymore? Oh, great question. Thank you so much. Um, you know, I, how I approach writing books is one thing I really try to do is I try to 
come up with conflicts and situations that I don't think I see reflected on the page a whole lot in other books that already exist in the world. And for me, with writing some of Edie's kind of friendship troubles, I just thought that was a really true to life experience that a lot of kids have and go through. And often in a lot of kids' books, you see kid characters whose friends maybe side with a bully or they have a falling out. There's often a redemption arc and they often kind of make up and come back together. But I don't think that that necessarily always happens or maybe it doesn't happen for many years. And that was just something I kind of wanted to leave a little bit open-ended and um, to show that, you know, sometimes people just grow up and grow apart. And even when that does happen, even though it is painful and it can be a difficult thing to go through, a difficult thing to write or to even read about, um, I just wanted to kind of honor that experience and show my young readers that sometimes the friends that you thought you were going to have forever when you're a kid will grow up and will become almost like strangers to you. But as long as you continue to keep your heart kind of open to making new friends and to not letting that really get you down, it will ultimately be okay. So that is why I chose to write it that way. Thank you so much for your question. Um, <laughs> um, how did you choose to make Edie a artist? Um, yeah, yeah, great question. Well, I decided to make Edie an artist character because I really like art. <laughs> and I really, really admire people who draw well and who are artists, like graphic novelists, for example. I think they're some of the most talented people, like Jerry Craft and Raina Telgemeier and so many incredible graphic novelists out there um, who combine words with pictures. That is not a skill that I have. I don't know about you, Diane. <laughs> right, so I mainly just work with words and um, but it's something I really admire and enjoy, so I decided to give her that particular skill and passion and hobby. Thank you. Great question. Hi. I wanted to tell you thank you. I've read The Seed Keeper, and it was an excellent book and such an eye-opener. Um, when I was growing up in Utah in Salt Lake City, in my elementary, junior high, and high school, there were probably three or four Navajo girls and that that I grew up with and they kind of kept to themselves and there was always this mystery that people didn't know and there they said oh yeah they they just brought her up from the reservation so they could use her as a housekeeper or you know they're not nice to her or they're nice at I never understood what it was and it almost seemed to be scary to go and reach out is and after hearing about the trauma, is there help for these people? And what really is happening with the people who grew up like that? Is there help for them with that type of trauma? Um, so you're, it, it, if I'm understanding correctly, you're, you're asking about um, the intergenerational trauma or historical trauma that's been passed down from boarding schools and other assimilation programs? Well, this particular one was an assimilation program in Utah. Yeah. Yes. So, th so this is this is the long this is the long work that <laughs> Native communities are facing, and I think um, so. There's so so there have been studies done for one thing about how we address intergenerational or historical trauma, and one of the ways that we do that is by understanding the history and and um, and by knowing our own history, it's a way of taking the shame out of it, that we see, we understand what has been done through government programs, through assimilation programs, that's one of the ways. Um, finding ways to rebuild the culture, so language revitalization programs, um, programs that return to indigenous foods, um, education, and, and I think just emphasizing the ways in which 
Native communities are rebuilding cultural identity. And that's why it's a long work, because you, if you have trauma in a generation, that generation has to find ways to heal it so that it's not transmitted to the next generation. But it's also helpful if the broader communities that we are part of, so communities um, bring in programs like you have done here through a novel idea, where it's not just native communities healing themselves with, without an understanding from the broader community that we are all part of, and so that we all share in this history, so that there is that, that responsibility that comes from knowing the history, both from a native um, perspective, but also from the settler perspective. And then taking responsibility for um, your, from, <clears throat> from, from a community perspective of, we're all in this together. So I don't know if that helps to, to, to respond to that, but um, it's a big question. Trauma is a big question. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. That helped. Thank you. Uh, I have a question for both of you. What are your favorite parts of the books? Ooh. Good one. What did I tell you? They are not afraid of the tricky questions. Oh. <laughs> I really love the end. I'm really proud of how Edie's story culminates and it all comes together. And as I said, I really believe that kids' books need to end with hope. I hope that I achieve that and that it is a really beautiful end to her story. Um, another, a, a couple other scenes that I really like and which kind of survived through multiple different drafts and revisions of the book. I really loved the firework scene towards the very beginning. And um, this one's going to be kind of weird and random, but I really enjoyed writing the scene also where she gets braces because that is just something that I really remembered from when I was a kid. And it's one of those things that is so many kids go through it. And there's a lot of kind of metaphor there as well that can be almost read as assimilation. And so, um, yeah, that was a metaphor I was pretty proud of. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Um, that's such an interesting question. I, I would have to say the, the, the poem that opens the book that is the seed speak. And it, it just came out of a, a writing exercise that I created because I was, I was actually trying to, I was struggling a little bit in the character development. So I would just do some free writing for each character. And then I decided, well, I'm gonna do this with the seeds and see what they have to say. And that, that's how mm -hmm. the poem emerged. And that, so that, it just, I felt such a, a deep connection to them in trying to listen to them that way. So thank you for your question. Uh, what were your favorite books when you were kids? Oh, oh I had so many. Uh, one of my absolute favorite books still to this day is Holes by Lewis Sacker. Yeah, I love it. That one always gets a reaction. Um, that is such a clever, genius book. The way that the the way that it's plotted, the way that the mysteries are kind of revealed, uh, it's like an intricate jigsaw puzzle, and yet it's such a short novel. And the way that the characters and their voices and their personalities are all so distinct, I love how. Um, the characters, their kind of family histories and their ancestors impact the characters' presence and their futures. That's like a theme in my mm -hmm. work that you can see, <laughs> obviously, is something I still grapple with and work through myself. Um, it is funny. It is fun. It does so many things. The, the setting at Camp Green Lake is so fascinating. E everything about Holes is really, really great. I also really loved... 
um, like Because of Wind dixie by Kate DiCamillo, mm -hmm. and Ella Enchanted by Gail Carson Levine, the Harry Potter series, <laughs> <laughs> and many others. <laughs> So my book choices go a little farther back. <laughs> um, and, uh, so one of my favorite books, though, was A Wrinkle in Time. Yeah, because back then, you know, this was, it was a very different time then for young girls growing up. So to have that that strong girl hero, and then of course time travel was awesome. So, yeah. <laughs> I forgot, Diane, did you want to read something? and Jackie Tsidsta, Spriala Pub, Strayapti Pasta. Hi, my name is Jackie. I'm enrolled Puyallup. I'm Neighboring with Christine, um, yeah, I am really nervous standing here talking because I don't tend to take up space, and I decided if there's a space for me to take up space, it's right here. Um, and so, uh, <laughs> thank you. Um, I am. I don't have a question. I just wanted to express a lot of gratitude. I'm just really, really grateful. Um, as you both know, the. Uh, just the beauty and connection and reconnection and reclaiming and language revitalization and you too, Gabriel and you know um, Michelle Carey and gosh everybody I'm so happy and Jefferson's here you know just all of these people and it's so wonderful to be surrounded in this space right here tonight with that um, it connecting so much I read your book Christine before it was part of novel idea and just connected so much to that and um, my story is not. Um, not too too different from that and um, and Diane then when I was reading there's a line in your book about um, being a kid always having her face pressed to the glass being like looking on the outside and when I first read that I resonated and I was like oh that's me and I I processed and processed and processed and I realized that's actually my old story I I am no longer looking on the outside. I am, this is who I am. I am reconnected to my family. I have done that labor and, um, you know, call it what colonization has taken away from it, but, um, but I'm not on the outside anymore. And um, both of your books just came at such like a, a profound time on my journey of reconnecting. And so just, he's quo. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. this promise was the dogs and like in the movie that Edie made or like if you continued the book where you have a different ending for the dog <laughs> <laughs> you know what's really interesting about the dog which is one of my other most frequently asked questions is what happened to the dog or why did they not bring the dog home? Or why is it that she, you know, connected with him so much that she brought him into her art and it was this big thing and yet he never came back? And, um, <laughs> well, it's interesting. It's really interesting, actually, because when I <laughs> was... This is going to be a little embarrassing, sorry. Um, <laughs> when I was writing this book, I was trying to come up with some way that the dog could come back and it would make sense. And my editor and I, we kind of talked about it and we never really figured it out. And I was like, well, I'll just leave it open-ended and see what the kids think, what happened to the dog. <laughs> and then, and then, and this is a true story, I was at a school visit <laughs> earlier this month, actually, and this question came up, what happened with the dog? Why? <laughs> Why? And um, I decided to be kind of transparent with them, and I told them that. I was like, well, to be honest, you know, I kind of tried to, I workshopped a couple different ways that, that maybe the dog could come back, and it just didn't really work or make sense, and so I left it open-ended, and I left that as like a, 
something that was never really tied up nicely in the book. It's just open-ended. And this 12-year-old girl, the sixth grader, raises her hand. She's like, I know how the dog could have come back. <laughs> and again, this is a book I worked on for two and a half years. <laughs> This sixth grader came up with a solution in about 30 seconds. <laughs> and she told me, and she, and she was like, well, what if this had happened? And she, I'll just go ahead and tell you. She was like, well, what if the dog had actually belonged to Roger? And then he was just like lost her. He just saw him when he wasn't with Roger while, he was, while she was at the fireworks stand. But then when they see each other again at the end of the canoe journey, he has his dog with him. The dog's back. <laughs> so simple. <laughs> it almost makes too much sense. <laughs> and now, and, and I, that, I was floored. I was like, well, now I just have to live with the regret for the rest of my life that I can't go back and change the book. But that's another reason why I love writing for kids is because they're just so much smarter than I am. So <laughs> thank you for that question. Um, why did Edith, Edith's parents think they had to tell her all of her history or none of it? Sorry, can you repeat that one one more time? Why did Edith's parents think that she, they had to tell her all of her history or none of it? Wow, that's a great question. Um, and I think that's... What a profound way of trying, of, ask, of like approaching this book and asking why, you're right, why is it that so often adults think it's kind of all or nothing with kids? Um, I don't really know. I mean, practically, I suppose that's just how I wrote it because it made the plot work. <laughs> but, <laughs> and so it had to be this kind of big, empty space that she wasn't really told anything and then she had to do some digging on her own which ultimately led to the revealing of everything but um I suppose that's just a dynamic between adults and children that I'm kind of fascinated by and we see that with book bannings for example that are happening really rampantly across the country where so many books are being removed from school libraries and they're pieces of legislature, we haven't even had a chance to talk about this in places like Oklahoma, where once a book is challenged by someone in the community, if librarians then don't remove the books from the school library within like a month, they can be fined thousands of dollars or maybe even lose their jobs. And that's something that is, that is the state senators and whoever is trying to pass in Oklahoma right now. And it's like, why? Why is it that some adults are so afraid of their kids reading books and of them exploring whatever it is that they might find in books? Um, to me, that is just sort of one of those evergreen questions. There's no real easy answer to it, or it doesn't make a ton of sense of why is it all or nothing, or why is it that adults overprotect kids to the point where they are almost lying to them. I don't really know. It's something that I am curious about and wonder about and think about quite a lot. And so that is why that's sort of an element in Edie's story for sure, because I think, I hope that the adults who read this book ask themselves, what am I trusting my kids with, and what am I not? Um, so, yeah, basically to make the plot work, to make adults think about what they, about how they are the gatekeepers in their kids' lives, and also to make kids ask questions like that too, I suppose, <laughs> which you just did, so thank you very much. Hi, this question is for Diane. And Diane, I grew up in Minnesota and received all my education. First time I heard about the march was your book. 
In fact, I never got one bit of Native American history. And unfortunately, in our area, we kind of looked down on our Native Americans that surrounded us. So I understand your experience. So our question, my question, kind of my book club's question, believe it or not, we got down to the subject of seeds. Mm -hmm. And uh, <laughs> we couldn't understand how a seed could last so long and still be able to grow. And the second thing, uh, Rosalie's husband start using seeds that were manufactured, or is that like GMO? Is that what you were trying to bring up, the type of uh, seeds you were doing? And I kind of, we'd like to know what your feeling is about that. About um, first, how, did, how do seeds remain viable so long? Yeah. So there are, there have been instances in which seeds have been, say, removed from a cave after who knows how many years and remained viable. It's a mystery. It's, a, it's bordering on miraculous sometimes how a seed can retain that tiny little spark of life. But they, they are capable of being stored for a very long time. Um, under the right conditions and remaining viable. Um, th and that's part of just the, the miracle that seeds are, that they are created in a way that, that they know how to respond and adapt to conditions and wait until the time is right to germinate. So it's just, it, it is just amazing to me. Um, and then the second part of your question was about genetically modified seeds. So one of the, one of the, um, that was one of the questions I thought about a lot in writing this book because it is such a polarizing discussion around um, genetically modified seeds, whether it's good science, bad science, uh, long-term consequences. And, and to me that is, that is uh, somewhat beside the point. It's a little too political. So what I really wanted to do in this story was redirect attention to what does this say about our relationship with seeds? So if we look at going as far back as that original agreement where human beings take care of seeds and seeds then feed human beings and both survive, and that all the way through time that, that people have taken care of seeds in a way that makes sure that they thrive so that they store them properly. They give them the right conditions for them to grow and um, to do what seeds are supposed to do, which is create plants, provide food, so human beings thrive. And so there's this mutually beneficial relationship. And once we move away from that, when we get into a relationship where we no longer regard that seed as a relative to us, where we look at it as a commodity, and it becomes something that we can manipulate its genetic structure. We can turn it into something that maybe isn't good long-term for the seed itself or for us, and that it's done for reasons of profit. Then, then what, we, what I wanted to look at was that relationship. What does that say about our relationship with seeds that we have allowed their, their genetics to be manipulated and what does this mean for the seeds and for people long term? So it's that relationship that, for me, is the was the real important piece. Thank you. Thank you for those. Okay. Thank you so much. <laughs> Thank you so much. Uh, that was such a wonderful evening. Um, and also, thank you to Jefferson. Um, and we look forward. We're going to actually do this again tomorrow night in Madras. So I really look forward to that. Uh, so please, a big round of applause for our, our guests. <laughs>